Good evening, everyone. To my great relief, this is my sixth and final lecture <laughs> of the series. I must say that it has been a very interesting ride, and although it has been tiring preparing uh, the six lectures, I must admit that I have enjoyed doing them. Uh, I've noticed that since my first lecture in early September, I was just looking at the old notes, I started in early September, uh, many of you in the audiences have been faithfully coming uh, for the lectures, and for that I, I thank you, I thank you for your interest and your support. Uh, I wish to thank IPS Director uh, Janadas, I think he was around just a while ago, for giving me the opportunity to do these uh, lectures as the 6th SR Nathan Fellow. And despite my constant grumbling to him, I'm glad he egged me on to do a substantial series of six lectures. Now, many people helped in many ways in the last nine months, and I want to especially thank Ariel Tan, Rachel Howe, Tan Lee Jen, Regine Tan for their assistance in all aspects of the lecture. And of course, a shout out to uh, the staff from IPS uh, for all the operational and logistic work which I know it entails a lot of work in organizing these lectures, and for that I'm very grateful for all your support. So I now return to the lecture. Now, in my previous lectures, I've spoken of Singapore's long history, explained how Singapore was shaped by forces of early globalization and of the continuities that underlie Singapore's position as an open port city constantly searching for hinterlands. In this long narrative, stretching over 700 years, Singapore's current status as a nation state appears, but as a short blip. Will Singapore endure as a nation state, even as it reverts to its traditional instincts as a global or port city that needs to stay open and connected in order to thrive? Where are we in the latest cycle of history, and what sort of future can we anticipate? Since 1965, Singapore has always been a forward-looking nation-state. It has tried to anticipate problems and stay ahead of the curve. This is of critical importance to a young city-state that does not have a civilizational core or a natural hinterland, and whose destiny has always been tied to larger forces beyond its shores. But even as we look forward, it is important to understand that our current situation is always the result of preceding events and that we are shaped by the circumstances, choices, and actions of the past. Therefore, we cannot understand our present situation without knowing history, much as we have been reminded that progress cannot be made by constantly looking at the rear mirror. As I had explained in an earlier lecture, there was a sense by the 1980s that young Singaporeans had lost touch with their history. And there was a need to introduce national education to provide an appreciation of the challenges we have to face in the past, where we have come from, how we got here, to give us a better sense of how we should be managing the present and perhaps plan for the future. In this lecture, I intend to discuss how we can better understand and appreciate our history and ask, is merely knowing what happened in the past sufficient? I will argue that having historical knowledge provides a necessary foundation. But to truly understand what history means and how it affects our personal and public lives, I will argue that we need to develop a deeper sense of historical consciousness and cultivate our capacity for historical imagination. So these are the three concepts that I'll be talking about today, very broadly historical literacy or histor historical knowledge, then historical consciousness and historical imagination. And you can see them in a progressive way, how you build on the foundation and move to a higher plane. So let me begin by talking about historical knowledge. How well do we know our history? Singaporeans are generally aware of the official, of the official Singapore story. This is taught in our schools featured in the biographies of our political leaders, performed in our National Day parades, and exhibited in the National Museums. Because of this exposure, Singaporeans may think that they already know all there is to know about Singapore's history, from colonialism, war and occupation, to political change and independence. Singaporeans are also aware of the broad history of the region and key pivotal world events, like the Second World War. 
The historical knowledge uh, can be seen from the results of a pop quiz on Singapore history conducted by Channel News Asia uh, last year. Among its interviewees, CNA found that younger Singaporeans between 20 and 40 years old did better on the quiz. The Singaporeans had been exposed to key dates and events as part of national education and therefore more well-versed with these facts. So these were the questions uh, that were asked in this pop quiz and um, the CNA found that uh, younger Singaporeans of that age uh, were able to answer many of these questions. Well, this and some of these questions, uh, this is not surprising as Singaporeans, especially those who went to school in an, from the 1990s onwards, have been exposed to national education and compulsory uh, social studies, which included history in a school curriculum. But history is more than the official Singapore narrative. This is not to say that historical knowledge imparted through state institutions like schools and museums is not important. The overarching narrative, the way in which the official history is written, provides a frame and a chronology with which to make sense of the series of events that resulted in Singapore becoming what it is today. Without that narrative, we would not have a coherent history of the nation state. But how do we make that history relatable to us as individuals or as members of a community? And is the national narrative the final word in our history? Or is there more to our history than what we have learned in schools and through state institutions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about historical consciousness now. Knowing and, knowing and linking key facts of the past do not necessarily make history personally relevant or meaningful. We have often heard the lament that history is dry and boring, a school subject that students have to study in order to pass examinations, and worse, nothing more than propaganda. Beyond historical literacy, that is knowing what happened, it is crucial to develop what I call historical consciousness, which is the ability to make the past have meanings to us as individuals and as communities. It is also the ability to understand why, why things happen. In other words, historical consciousness allows us to develop individual and collective understandings of the past and to be aware of the cognitive and cultural factors that shape these understandings. Now, historical consciousness essentially rests on collective memories. Collective memories are shared memories and knowledge of a social group. These memories are used by this group to interpret a past that would resonate with the way they identify themselves, who they are, their, personal, their identities as a group. So I'll give you an example. The Chinese people remember the period between 1839, the start of the Opium War, to 1949, as the century of humiliation, during which China was bullied and humiliated by foreign powers. This powerful collective memory influences the way China conducts itself in world affairs today. Sometimes these collective memories are framed as part of present day developments rather than rooted in the past. Many younger Singaporeans may find historical consciousness difficult to achieve because they lack the lived memories that earlier generations had, some painful and frightening, others bittersweet and or exciting. Historical consciousness had been eroded by collective forgetfulness when direct links to an immediate past have been replaced by an orientation towards change and progress. Singapore's rapid development in the past 50 years has challenged the different ways people bind themselves to their community and country experiencing constant change in our physical and social environments can leave precious few things that yield sufficient attachment and endearing familiarity to people. Memories fade when traces of the past start to vanish. We cannot take for granted that the physical embodiments of our history, elements of our collective memories, will always be here to stay. To return to an earlier lecture, someone in the audience uh, raised the question of how to anchor national identity in the face of continual loss of physical spaces, such as places of worship and schools, and the resulting erasures of our past. My response was that anchoring national identity to physical embodiments of memories and heritage remains a perennial challenge for a small country like Singapore. 
there is always the tension between pursuing progress and efficient land use on the one hand and preserving physical spaces that people deem to be of historical and cultural value on the other. Now, national monuments in Singapore of historic, cultural and symbolic significance, etc., as well as national importance, have been protected by the Preservation of Monuments Board, later renamed the Preservation of Sites and Monuments, a division under the National Heritage Board. Separately, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, URA, has done its part in preserving old buildings as part of land use planning. While these attempts, sometimes promoted by civic activism, have been laudable, it's not always possible to keep things unchanged due to Singapore's limited land area. Still, there is no disputing that heritage sites add value to the landscape and provide a sense of familiarity, place and time, rooting the people of Singapore to their homeland. And in this regard, um, the NHB is working very hard to see how they could identify uh, the value of historical sites and find ways of preserving them at the pressures of land notwithstanding. But perhaps we can think of alternative ways of developing and preserving memories of space. Here is where um, I want to make reference to a project that was done uh, by a group of young Singaporeans um, documenting the merger of two junior colleges which happened very recently, Tampanese JC and Meridian JC. And this is produced as part of a project that was led by Yale and US College. Um, I will now ask the uh, technician at the back to play a clip um, to show you um, what they have tried to recollect as a result of this documentary. I really love the early days of this college when the architects who did this building painted it this sort of off-white in a greyish tone. It's so white and it is so majestic that building stands there, beautiful. At that time, there were no flats surrounding this area. There wasn't that building behind, there wasn't building at the side. It was like heaven, really. You know, it was very relaxed. I didn't know that I was going to spend the longest thing in TPJC. 27 years, 5 months. I think I spent more waking hours here than I spent at home. When I first arrived here, we were the 13th JC, and naturally we ranked 13 at that time. But we crept up slowly to a point where we were even close to number eight, you know. But towards the later years, somehow things goes up, goes down, it goes like that. People always talk about, oh, you're not teaching in the top five JC. I used to tell them I'm still very proud of my students because I have seen students who did so terribly in TPJC. I could have killed them sometimes. But in later part in life, when they came to see me and they gave me their name card, I'm very proud of what they have done. Education doesn't end just within that two years. Well, hopefully that this place give them that passing through period of two years to get to their next destination. I think there is a magic in this room. There is a homeliness here. Even when you have left, you want to come back, lah, you know. It's a room that they, they just feel comfortable, they, they always say. We were like sometimes the mother to the, to the students. They celebrated some years, uh, Mother's Day, art room mothers. <laughs> Those old batches, oh my goodness, they do a lot of horror things to us. One year on my birthday, they did a Batik banner outside here. Good grief, announced to the whole world it's my birthday. I don't know what they're going to do with the building, but ultimately, it will no longer be here. And I think all my 27 years is the association of this room. We have that sentimental feeling of the building. You know, why should bricks and, and, and this thing have anything to, to do with the thing? But then, as I said, when I went back to Tanjung Gadung Girls, it, it, it's just a building, but they have kept it as it is. I'm so glad when I entered the front porch, the mosaic tiles were still there. They didn't remove it. 
So all of us were so excited. E, still the same, you know? It is people who have experienced that past that can have that memory. People who are new, what is a building? The building is just a building, you know, it is a dome-shaped thing. We cannot say that we are not replaceable. We cannot say that we are so special that we must be there. Every place, every JC has got something to fulfil. This thing about missing is not so much of new people who are coming in. New people just go to new places. I don't think they ever miss anything. Whatever will be, will be. We have to accept it and move on, you know. If it got to go, it got to go. So this was a documentary. Uh, it was done by a group of young Singaporeans who wanted to capture that sense of change um, that individuals linked to the two colleges were feeling at the time of transition. And I thought that this interview uh, with this art teacher who spent a quarter of a decade working in the school captured the feelings uh, very well. Uh, it was a very poignant reflection of what the place meant to her and what this change would mean to her and of the constant movement of history and how one has to come to terms with it at a personal level. So digital preservation of memories like this could perhaps be one way forward as we try to capture our sense of the past. But digital preservation of memories, I agree, as opposed to physical conservation of places may not be ideal, but it is still a way of preserving memories. Now, historical consciousness happens when there is personal resonance with the past, as we have witnessed here. This often has deep influences on perceptions and reactions to the way history is remembered through public events. Now, I want to give you an example of uh, something that most of you may have read about just a couple of years ago. Um, this was the exhibition gallery on the Japanese occupation at a former Ford factory. Originally, the gallery and exhibition was named uh, the Sionan Gallery to reflect the name that the Japanese gave Singapore under the occupation. Of course, Sionan had negative connotations, but the curators argued that referencing Sionan was a way of remembering a painful chapter in Singapore's past and Singapore's vulnerability. However, following public outcry from others who saw the name Sionan Gallery as inappropriately glorifying the occupation, the exhibition and gallery was renamed Surviving the Japanese Occupation, War and Its Legacies. The latter group may have been a loud minority, but it, this incident revealed the importance of taking into account the different feelings and significance that different groups in society attach to a single historical event. In this instance, the majority of society may have had no opinion uh, or were emotionally and intellectually prepared to move on. But there were people who still had painful memories of that period and it was necessary to respectfully validate those sentiments and connections to the past. Historical consciousness can be enhanced when we take ownership of our histories and not allow historical inheritance and collective memories to erode with time. But people have also said that Singapore is historically sterile. All we have is ultra-modernity. History is being lost in the name of progress. Well, I'm not sure if I agree with this sentiment. Thanks to the effort of the National Heritage Board, you will find that history is actually all around us. As such, making time to pause and read the commemorative plaques and signs that display historical information is one step we can all take to understand the history around us. Few people know, for instance, that the Hawker Centre at Tiong Bahru was probably the first such centre to be paid for by the hawkers themselves in a grand collective action. These men, and most of them were illegal uh, itinerant hawkers previously, got together negotiated with the government and raised an infrastructure that was later redeveloped into a two-story building seen along uh, Sing Po Road today. This is not a piece of history we will find readily in our history books or even in the science in front of Tiong Bahru Market, but it is a true Singaporean story. For the more internet savvy among us, the website roots.sg 
is a website, uh, a website run by the National Heritage Board, maps out heritage trails, monuments, historical site markers, buildings and sites, among other material. Uh, it also documents Singapore's national collection, allowing users to view images and other information relating to artifacts. This resource, which was launched in 2016, is publicly accessible and is one way we can explore Singapore's history in our own time. There is also an abundance of materials in the National Library and National Archives. Among these materials are stories of the past from individual perspectives that can make history come to life with the potential to evoke sympathy and emotional resonance. One example, and I was listening to some of these uh, uh, oral histories, is of a man who miraculously escaped being killed at Changi Beach during Operation Sukching. His oral history audio recording can be found in archives online, and I thought I'd share an excerpt of his account with you. So if we could play the audio visual while you read uh, the account which I reproduce here. Sound is supposed to come on. It was then that we began to worry as to what would happen. So one of the captives in a group asked the Japanese soldiers, he has a master, any manapigi, he spoke in Malay. Then the, the soldier replied, huh? either Sana itu go, ah, sanjian, kok, 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 okay. In other words, he meant that we would be retained for three days, chipping rocks, and we would be released. So we thought that our destination would be Changi Prison, because the lorries were heading towards Changi Road. Then after when we passed Changi Prison and the lorries didn't stop, that we began to have more worries. We were imagining all sorts of things. And our hands were tight behind our back. Our knees were tight. And they were so tight that blood circulation began to affect us. And we were telling ourselves that uh, they were really going to shoot us. They were really going to kill us. Because the men said we would stop somewhere near the Changi prison, chip stones for three days, and then we would be released. There's a, there's a second part, and I'll continue the video. So I swam and swam. Until I was so tired, I said, well, this is the time I drowned. I told myself that. So I just allowed myself to go down. My, both my uh, <coughs> feet touched bottom. And then, believe me or not, my nose was just above water. When I looked back, it was around about 600 yards from the shore. I say 600 yards because I know the distance. During our manoeuvring days, we used to go for shooting practice. And you know, 600 yards is about that distance. So when I look back at the shore, it was around about 600 yards. It was then that I heard a whistle, an ordinary whistle. And some or other, it clicked in my mind. It says, this is when the firing would start. And actually, after the whistle, the mission guard opened up. You see, I took a deep breath and went underwater. And I could hear the bullets ricocheting above me. I never knew what a ricocheting bullet sounded like. And that was the first occasion I heard it. It went zoom, zoom, zoom above water. So this. I thought I'd share this oral um, account with you because it captured the thought process of the individual, Mr. Yap, 
who went through that harrowing experience of being herded um, to be executed. And also, he was able to capture, I think, the flavor of the times when he was trying to estimate distance, when he was, when he was in the water, and trying to escape being killed at the same time. So oral accounts such as this um, brings history to life, and they are all available in the archives and in the National Library. And there is indeed a treasure trove of material, be it compelling anecdotes or intriguing artifacts, which already exist in the public domain, essentially all at our fingertips. So if you are serious about historical consciousness, these are materials we can use to build our knowledge and to aid our exploration of and how we imagine the past. The next point I would like to make about historical consciousness is that it is not just an intuitive feeling or a, a memory. Historical consciousness requires a degree of intellectual rigor and open-mindedness, seeking to understand why decisions were made and searching for nuance. It goes beyond simply asking what happened by questioning why it happened. To understand why things happen, it is important to appreciate context, to understand events in their proper environments, and also to accept that history does not always progress in a straight line, that our present and future can be shaped by unexpected contingencies and twists. So let me talk a little bit about the next two uh, themes. First, the centrality of context. Historical actions and events do not happen in isolation. The environment in which things happen and the circumstances of the time often shape and determine why and how decisions and actions are taken. Understanding context is a good antidote to the inappropriateness of hindsight. Understanding the culture, collective mentality, of physical or technological and geographical environment in which things happen allows us to interpret and understand events and actions in the time and place in which the situation occurred rather than merely judge them by contemporary standards or worse, in accordance with our own beliefs or prejudices. We appreciate things better when we do not impose our own lenses and perspectives to understand past decisions. We cannot assume that historical actors have the privilege of knowing what the future holds when they make the choices of their time. Their choices and options are necessarily limited by the realities of their immediate context. Let me offer an example. On 13th May 1940, Winston Churchill made his first speech in the House of Commons, announcing that he had nothing to offer but blood, tears, toil, and sweat. He pledged himself to a policy of waging war by sea, land, and air, with a single aim of victory at all cost, victory in spite of all terror, victory however hard and long the road may be. This is a direct quote. Now, this short speech is now regarded as a turning point, an iconic moment in the history of the war. It would be easy to believe, hearing that speech now, that Britain had turned the corner and was on its way to defeating the Nazis. But this view is coloured by hindsight and by our knowledge that Britain and the Allies would emerge victorious from the war eventually. Was this true of what confronted Churchill and his audience at that time? Obviously not. In the short term, Britain, after that speech, was about to enter into its darkest hour and Singapore would fall less than two years after that speech. So it's easy, with hindsight, to say that, oh, this was the turning moment, this man was brave, he had the, all the right ideas, he was defiant, but what if he was wrong? What if the defiance had turned into a disastrous de defeat for Britain at the hands of the Nazis? How would he remem be remembered? So I think it's important to understand how those things evolved during that time and the decisions that he took in the context of what he had uh, to work with and what he knew at the time. Understanding context allows the historical individual to predict the likely consequences, likely consequences of his proposed action, not certainty. But it also enables the historian to explain the actual consequences. So with hindsight, the historian can then explain what actually happened. The historical player can never be certain, can never be certain of the future. At best, he or she can only deal with probabilities, probabilities. Let me next turn to contingency. Now, many of you may have heard of the assertion that if Cleopatra's nose had been shorter, the course of Western history would have been different. Basically, this was a, this was a concept developed by a, a French mathematician, Pascal, who argued that if 
her nose was shorter, she would not have been that attractive. She would not have attracted Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, and a civil war might have been averted, and we might all be using Latin today. Human affairs are unpredictable, and events do not proceed on predetermined trajectories. Sheer chance and contingencies can be powerful forces determining outcomes in history. Histories that are used to project progress and advancement tend to underplay or ignore the role of chance. This is true of Marxist, religious historians, or those who are influenced by theories and are seeking hidden patterns or forces in history. They tend to believe that events follow a set and predetermined course, which allows them to predict the future. But we all know that the unexpected happens, and at each critical point in our past, the historical trajectory could have taken an unexpected turn caused by the force of personality or unanticipated circumstances, leading us down a particular path which might not have been planned. Let me give you an example. In the 1950s, Singapore could not envisage a future without the Malayan hinterland. I've said this before in my earlier lectures. The PAP government made merger with Malaya its election manifesto in 1959. And after a bout of rather acrimonious negotiations with its Malayan counterparts, Singapore became part of Malaysia in 1963. In the process, the PAP split and the left-wing leadership was decimated. Everyone at that point in time thought that the deed was done and Singapore had returned to its rightful place within the Malaysian nation. But troubles soon followed and the relations between Singapore and Kuala Lumpur got worse. The strained relationship became untenable when the ideological differences between Malay primacy and a Malaysian Malaysia came to a head. So despite the efforts and desires that led to merger, <clears throat> the marriage broke up within two, year, two years. So on 9th August 1965, Singapore proclaimed its independence, officially leaving Malaysia. Did Lee Kuan Yew and his colleagues expect this to happen in September 1963 when he proclaimed Madaka, Singapore joined Malaysia? Probably not. So the point about contingencies is that things can take unexpected turns, so it's always easy for us with hindsight to say that you know, history would have moved along this trajectory, but if we do not understand things in a context and if we do not take into consideration chance, contingency, or sure unexpected outcomes, then you will find that um, understanding history is a lot more complex than we think. Now, before I leave the point on historical consciousness, um, let me restate this. Now, history may be necessary for nation-building purposes. It is a powerful device at the same time that gives meanings to our personal identities. Personal and shared historical experience is an important maker and marker of identity. And having a strong sense of historical consciousness will not only give us a better appreciation of our own personal identities or the identities of our group or our communities, it will help us to understand what makes and holds us together as a community and as a country. But this is not sufficient, and I'm going one level up, and this is to talk about historical imagination or the need for historical imagination. We need historical imagination in our writing and understanding of history. What do I mean by historical imagination? You would think that when I speak of imagination, I'm talking about fiction. Well, the imaginary does not have to be unreal or fictional. Historical imagination has to do with the ability to offer new ways of thinking about past events, to not only examine the observable, what you can see that is obvious, that can be seen from the outside, but also to find clues and traces of the unobservable. For example, the thoughts, the motivations behind each actions. It's easy to explain what happened when you just look at things that happened, but what motivated those? What were the thought process that led to that kind of actions and decisions? This is harder. So how does one, for example, uh, write the history of an event or group of people for which there are limited primary sources and written documentation? This was something the subaltern school historians had to contend with when writing about peasant uprisings in British India from the perspective of the peasants. The peasants don't keep records. So how do you understand what motivated the peasants to rise, to revolt? Now, from the perspective of the British, it's easy. Those guys were creating trouble. They were troublemakers. They were revolutionaries, re rebels. But what is it that motivated the 
pheasants to rise again. It could be harsh treatment, unfair treatment, taxes on land, etc., etc. So you need to understand this. How do you get behind that? How do you get into thoughts to explain this? In 1957, 1857, there was a huge mutiny in Britain which nearly overturned um, British rule. Um, the East India Company folded later on and India was taken over by the British Raj, directly ruled from London. Now, at that time, the interpretation was that this was just a mutiny, a group of soldiers who decided to shoot their officers because the pay was no good, they were made to do things that against their religious beliefs, and it was just decided, it was just interpreted as a military mutiny involving a few regiments. But new research has shown that it is more than just a military mutiny because it involved various groups coalescing together behind the mutineers. It was about the, the zamindars, the landowners, who lost their land to the British. It was about the princes who had lost their political power to the British. It was about people who felt that their lives had been disrupted by the British. So if you dug deeper and understand the, the thoughts behind this, then you understand that it was not so much a mutiny, but a rebellion and a revolution involving many groups of Indians at that point in time. So it is important for us to have some form of historical imagination to go behind the, the action. Now, I cite another example here to demonstrate what I mean, closer to home. Uh, I would like to share with you a, a seminar that was given by um, a young colleague from the history department, uh, Dr. Nafertzila Yahya, on the Sepoy mutiny in Singapore in 1915. I talked about the 1857 mutiny. This is the Sepoy mutiny that happened here in 1915 uh, during the First World War. The colonial archive on the event is focused on the government and army command. How does one write the history of the Sepoy mutiny from the perspective of the soldiers? Now, this is just a slide of the uh, firing squad that uh, executed the, the mutineers. Now, Dr. Yahya's research looked at Sepoy testimonies. So she went to read the testimonies recorded verbatim by British officers in the aftermath of the mutiny, as well as letters that were intercepted and translated, which offered a rare insight into the motivations of the soldiers and their views on their military postings. Through these transcripts and testimonies, one gets a palpable, poignant sense of the soldiers' sense of isolation, the soldiers' sense of isolation, as they were subjected to what she calls or describes as a life of circulation without mobility. What emerged was fascinating. An interesting point that she picked up in a commission of inquiry report issued after the 1915 mutiny was the frequent mention of going towards Singapore. The Sepoys kept referring to going towards Singapore. But they were in Singapore. They were already stationed on the island. So what did they mean? Local civilians were reportedly puzzled by the soldiers' request for directions to Singapore. The term Singapore, Dr. Yahya suggests, seemed to have referred to the urban core, to the city, to the town of the island, even though its geographical contours were never defined by the sepoy or the soldiers. And this serves to reinforce the argument that the soldiers were kept apart from the rest of Singapore. They were isolated, they were kept in the cantonments, they didn't know that they were already in Singapore. To them, Singapore was another part of the world which they could only imagine. So they were displaced and disconnected, essentially, from the environments they were supposed to guard and protect. So with some degree of historical imagination, you see a totally new perspective about the Sepoy mutiny. Now in this regard, historians are constantly pushing the boundaries of historical knowledge. The, the discipline expects this of them, and efforts at revising history and adding to existing historical knowledge should be welcome. This is where historical imagination comes in. It involves employing creativity in interpreting sources, archival documents, legal documents, oral history interviews, etc., and coming up with new analytical frameworks all within, and I underscore this, all within the perimeters of evidence-based historical context. Because, as I said earlier, historical imagination is not fiction. The historian is not a novelist. The historian tries to use his imagination to understand the thoughts behind certain actions, but this has to be done with evidence and in the context of the times where these things happen. Now, I want to make a, 
Another point about historians, and that is that historians are storytellers. We all love to tell stories. They craft narratives in an attempt to make sense of what happened. And one of the marks of good historical scholarship is the combination of careful documentation, careful meticulous documentation with artful construction, how you draft a narrative. Good history is rigorous, critical, and compelling. People should ideally want to read it, find out more about it, and be excited by it. How else can history be educational, relatable, and relevant? Now, I just want to uh, do another pitch for the Yale and U.S. College. Just recently, from February to March, the college organized a month-long history and art festival in conjunction with the Singapore Bicentennial. Named the future of our past, history reimagined, the festival was focused on engaging with history outside of academia. We were very conscious. We didn't want more historians to tell us their, their history in their own turgid academic style. We wanted fresh ideas. The intention was to get more people interested in history through stories. When a call for project proposals was launched in 2017, applicants were encouraged to examine less explored aspects of Singapore history, less explored aspects of Singapore history, and to present their research findings using artistic, creative mediums. Don't write another book, don't write another article, present it in ways that could be engaging. We wanted young Singaporeans to write their own history, and in doing so, develop a sense of belonging and identity. 11 projects by students and recent graduates from different tertiary institutions in Singapore were selected for the festival. And over a year and a half after the open call, the teams got to refine their ideas and projects through a series of workshops and critique sessions attended by artists, writers, curators, and academics. For some cr project creators uh, who were undertaking a creative project for the first time, it was a, it was a journey of learning and discovery. Through the process of project making, one also became, becomes aware of the complexities of history writing and the art or the act of constructing a narrative. Through the works, we encountered personal histories, um, community histories, histories of places gone and places still in existence. You've seen the run recently done on the merger of the two JCs. We encountered stories by young people in Singapore of love, loss, self-discovery and identity, stories we can all relate to in some way. Each project provided different entry points for audiences to reimagine Singapore's history through performances, exhibitions, public installations, books, films, and a web-based interactive documentary. In addition, fringe programs, including film screenings, walking tours, talks, panel discussions, were also organized to encourage conversations about history. So the whole effort was geared towards opening up what history means and how people can engage history through different forms. And I, I would say that uh, after uh, watching the various exhibitions, the, the shows, uh, it was a successful program. Now, I just want to mention one. Among the festival projects was this, this uh, part interactive theater, part installation called First Stories. Now, this young man was so creative that he actually hired an old abandon uh, community center and turn it into a housing estate office of the 1970s and there he recreated the scene and all of us who attended participated in the scene where you had gone to report um, to the housing officer on resettlement and we all made to fill up forms declaring how many durian trees we had how many rambutan trees we had and going through the process was in interesting. And then we were met with an officer who would tell us, oh, I can only compensate you this much because this land doesn't belong to you, or a durian tree, would, you get $25, a rambutan tree, you get $10, and so on. So this was felt, this was experienced by us personally. And then he created a scene where a Malay woman and a Chinese woman would argue because they were going to be put alongside each other, and they had such cultural differences that they were worried one had to move from a kampong, the other one had to move from a townhouse. They were going to be living together in a small HDB estate. Now, this was a way in which history was brought to life, recreated by this young man who had personal relations with this because his own parents, his own grandparents experienced the resettlement. Now, he said that history is not just about the big narrative, but something that is personal, immediate, and relevant. And this history was personal and relevant to him. So personal histories matter as much as broad historical narratives. Then there is another project. 
This one is interesting. This is uh, Boca di Story, a graphic novel bringing to life the history and culture of the Eurasian community in Singapore. Boca di Story, uh, the title of the graphic novel, uh, is a Kristang phrase that translates into English as mouth of stories. It means storyteller. This was driven by a group of students who were very interested in reviving the Kristang language. And a large part of the project involved um, the creators speaking to members of the Eurasian community to collect stories and materials for the novel. So this was uh, some of the sketchings that we've got, and this product is going to be released, I think, very soon. Now, another graphic novel, which I think all of you are familiar with, is this by uh, Sunny Liu, the uh, art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai. Now, um, this was actually a quite uh, a, a work that was uh, circulated quite widely and has been described as uh, an ambitious and innovative work by um, some reviewers. But what makes this work distinctive, especially from a historical perspective, is that um, Charlie Chan Hock Chai, the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, manages to move seamlessly, unhampered, between fact and fiction. So Sunny Liu spent a lot of time research. Now, if you look carefully at some of the materials he has used, there's a lot of thorough research. And he was using research to retell, retell the historical events of Singapore. And you can see this in his footnotes and his sources. But what he does very cleverly is that he turns evidence on its head. He took a counterfactual approach, subverts the methods used traditionally by historians working with conventional academic settings to establish veracity like photographs, photographs, uh, newspaper cuttings, and so on. So he makes use of the historian's method, um, but then he turns the story around um, to make a point. Now, we can reasonably conclude that the point he was trying to make, or challenges, was not to take any text and narrative for granted. Things can change, depends on how we interpret it. Now, the success and popularity of Chali Chan Hock Chai in Singapore demonstrates perhaps the following points. The medium of the comic book or the graphic novel, like other artistic approaches to historical narratives, allows us perhaps to expand our historical imagination. It makes history perhaps more accessible outside of academic books. And it could, in a way, generate some openness and growing appetite for Singaporeans for new interpretations of Singapore history. So let me conclude. As Singapore develops as a country, it is critical for us to have a deeper, more inclusive, and more nuanced appreciation of our history and heritage. This should not be driven solely by the government in the form of national education. We should also encourage bottom-up, community-led efforts so that history becomes an organic, shared, and inclusive force in the making of national identity. Why is history important? And I got some quotes from historians, because, among other things, it allows us to fulfill our need for self-examination awareness, to know ourselves, self-examination, self-awareness. And what is needed is the study of how we came to be the sorts of people that we are, of why we have the perceptions, the outlooks, and the attitudes that we have. But history is not just about bringing us up to speed with what we were and what we are now. Historical imag imagination comes into play here. We weave the past events, interactions, and individuals into a comprehensive narrative. We make sense of it all. Historical consciousness and imagination also means being open to nuance and accepting complexity. We tend to simplify history, but the pattern within which events are ordered is not always identifiable in a single unequivocal fashion. And it may happen that different historians understand and construe history in ways that are different. This is not to say that all frameworks are equally plausible, but historical imagination should mean the possibility of different ways of seeing, of different ways of seeing. Edward Luce, a British journalist, recently wrote an article in the Financial Times making a case for the relevance of history. History is decreasing in popularity in the US, he argues while fields like science, technology, engineering, mathematics are all seen as paths to economic success. We may rely more on algorithms and automation today, but it is still up to us as individuals to discern, judge, and be well informed so that we don't fall prey to civic ignorance, fake news, 
and other phenomena that may divide us. As he puts it, I thought very eloquently, a well-informed citizenry in turn creates a stronger society. He said, we may no longer be interested in history, but history is interested in us. Let me end with a quote from Henry Kissinger. I think at an earlier lecture, the book was mentioned. In his book, World Order, he made the following observation. At the end of the book, he said, long ago in youth, I was brash enough to think myself able to pronounce on the meaning of history. I now know that history's meaning is a matter to be discovered, not declared. It is a question we must attempt to answer as best we can in recognition that it will remain open to debate. Thank you very much. So, uh, Taiyong, uh, you look visibly relieved. <laughs> but uh, thank you for a most uh, insightful, and I must say we all enjoyed uh, the fascinating examples that, that make your points more concrete. Uh, we're not going to let you go because you have to run the last mile. Right? Um, could I just uh, open up by, by just making an observation? You spoke about painful and what might be called traumatic memories. Seems to me that almost every country would have such memories. Uh, you think of Indonesia and the events of the mid-60s. You think of Cambodia and the, the genocide. You think of perhaps China and the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Singapore may have some of these examples going back to the days of decolonization and early nationhood. Uh, it seems to me that uh, when we revisit and reflect on those uh, past events, we are not just trying to reconcile or find a relationship with, with them, but there could also be a component of not just remembering the past, but in some sense, imagining the future. I think this might be what you're indicating. And perhaps it's a desired future which has a tension between some ideals of what that desired future might be, as well as some reality check on what are the limitations that could be even because of the lessons of history. And so, Could you quickly comment on that? Mm. Well, that's the whole point of history, right? History is about changes over time. And uh, what I was at pains to talk about was that, you know, uh, history happens in a certain context and that, you know, the trajectory is one that is never predetermined uh, and that unexpected things happen. So if we were to look into our past, into our history and try to understand what it means to us personally, I think you have to relate to the history personally. So it's not about just reading it in books or being told to you in certain sort of uh, platforms and formats and they say, okay, this is history, uh, just, just accept this and this is what the past is. I think it would lose its resonance if it's done like that. So history has to have personal meanings and historical consciousness is a way of building that relation with history. But history also tells us that you know, uh, decisions were made at a certain time in a certain context that have certain repercussions. And understanding that is important because you can always go back and say, why didn't he do this or why wasn't this done or why didn't we go that way? It's easy with hindsight. But to be able to appreciate the choices that were available to the decision makers at the time, even to your family, to your father, your mother, I think you'll be able to better appreciate the kinds of challenges that we were facing. And then in that sense, if you can extrapolate to the future, what are the conditions you need to have in order to move to a future. So uh, if you looked at Singapore in the 50s, in the 40s, emerging out of colonialism, emerging out of war, the kinds of deprivations, the challenges, the political differences, um, the different ideas and visions and ideals that different people had, and then decisions were taken, and then we went down a particular path. Are, there, are these going to repeat themselves again? Or is Singapore now set on a path where you know, the future is now more or less predetermined? I don't think so. I think you're going to see different challenges coming up, different sets of contexts operating that may constrain the way we do certain things. So the whole point of my six lectures is to say that there are continuities in our history, but history also moves off tangent at different points in time. And if you take that broad view, you will understand that it sometimes doesn't give you comfort, but it at least gives you a sense 
of where we've come from and where we might be headed. Thank you, Tai Young. Uh, now, we do have somewhat generous time to make full use of, and this is our last chance uh, to uh, ask questions in a very interesting, at the end of a very interesting series. Could I invite uh, uh, questions particularly, and if we can keep them succinct so that more of us can have an opportunity to delve a little deeper. We only ask that you just perhaps uh, introduce yourself very quickly and then move on to your question. Who would like to be the first? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. And there's a mic. Uh, shall we bring the mic to you, uh, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll scan and perhaps... Uh, okay. Sorry, I cannot stand because my back is that, not... Uh, that's fine. Please go ahead. Yeah. Functional, as you know. Uh, my question has got to do with... One very important building, which housed a very important family for a very long time. <laughs> I wonder what building is that? Yeah. I will leave it to your historical imagination. <laughs> but as a historian, Professor Tan, what is your imagination about how this heritage should be preserved? Should we bulldoze it to the ground? Should we convert it to a garden of remembrance? Or should we have the basement left standing? And what about people, the hua, the, the hua palua, you know? What role do they have in contributing to the preservation of this quite Historical building. Can I address yeah. this? Sure. Thank you. To address this Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Tayong, a great first question, please. Okay. <laughs> so, so let me uh, start with a caveat. I'm not speaking as a policy maker. I'm but a poor historian <laughs> trying to make a living in a university. Okay. So I will offer you my personal view. And I've expressed this personal view to many of my friends. My personal view is that if this were the last will and testament of Mr. Lee, I'm assuming you're referring to that house, right? Then I think we should just honor it, all right? Uh, if, he, if that's what he wants, and that's what he wants uh, for, for, his, uh, for posterity, then I think we should just honor it. But people have opposed my view and say that, but the house doesn't belong to him as an individual. He's not an ordinary citizen. It's got national importance and historic value. And there are many ways of remembering that. I don't think we want to build or preserve one part of the house, the, the basement or a garden, but maybe a plaque that say here was the site in which the PAP had its earlier, or the, the precursors of the PAP had its earliest meetings, and that would be historically sufficient. Um, whether or not my view is the right view, um, it's one view. Others may disagree with me. But I've seen houses that are preserved in other parts of the world to honour founding fathers. And the sad thing is that they go into disrepair very quickly. And after two generations, people have forgotten the significance of these physical, physical structures. And unless this is done carefully, it may just be one of those um, old museums 50 years down the road, 80 years down the road, where people don't care a lot about. But as I said, this is just my view, and I want to state categorically that it does not represent the view of my, organ my employer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> enough qualification. <laughs> Better be sure. Uh, we saw another question, a hand shot up. In the, uh, was there? Yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Uh, was there, a, there was, I think the, the person first. Yeah. Could we just uh, yield? Who was that uh, in the middle? Was that there? there was a person just behind, but I think he sat down. So, so I think okay, how about you go ahead first in the meanwhile, and the rest don't be afraid to raise your hand. Okay, a quick one. Yeah. Prof Tan, thank you very much for your inspiring series of lectures. Um, I'd like to address the point that you raised about historical imagination. Could there be misplaced historical imagination? 
For instance, um, in our primary four social studies textbooks, it stated, separation was a sad moment for the leaders and people in Singapore. Often that is associated with the moment of anguish when uh, Mr. Lee cried. But in actual fact, on that day, in Chinatown, people were letting off firecrackers. There were some people who were excited. Well, of course, there were a number who were sad and anxious. But I think sometimes if the historical imagination is limited to a certain scene, that scene when Mr. Lee cried, then it becomes an overgeneralization when we say separation was a sad day, when actually it was a day of mixed emotions. So uh, what, what's your view about um, misplaced historical imagination? Thank you. No, I, 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 don't, I won't call it misplaced imagination. I would call it how you interpret certain actions and events. And that's the point about history. It's so complex, right? Because if you were to just arrow in or narrow in on a particular point, you're going to see, you know, it's like feeling the elephant, right? If you feel only one part, you're going to say that the elephant's a wall. If you feel the tail, it's going to be a rope. So it's how you zoom out, how you zoom out and try to see the thing in its totality. I don't think both reactions were wrong. I mean, for Mr. Lee in 1965, he was worried. What's going to happen to Singapore? You know, all his life, as he claimed, he had planned to go into Malaysia and he put his eggs in that basket. And now, quite unexpectedly, two years, Singapore was out. What's going to happen next? But of course, there was that, that, that part in him, that resolute, that resolute part of him, said, well, we'll try to make Singapore work. And he did. There were other people who had got fed up with Malaysia in 1964 because they felt that, look, all these promises of a common market, of uh, being able to get licenses to operate, were not happening. So we might as well get out earlier. And then, of course, the racial riots and all this. So different groups of people reacted differently. But I guess as decision makers, as leaders of the country, they were rightfully concerned that what was Singapore going to be like after coming out of Malaysia in a world, in a region, that was not friendly. Confrontasi was happening. He had just uh, exited Malaysia. The Cold War was happening, and so on. So there were grounds for concern, but there were other people who had different sorts of concerns, and maybe they were happier to see Singapore out of Malaysia. So I won't say that it's misplaced, but it's just different perceptions. Thank you. Next, please. Uh Yes, up there. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, so, uh, Professor, you talked just, just share your name with us. Maybe. Oh, I'm Owen. I'm from EJC. Yeah. Thank uh, you. So, uh, Professor, just now you um, talked about how you know there's a need for people to engage with history. You know, like have that sort of consciousness. I just wanted to ask about you know the limits to that. There seem to be certain limits to historical discourse in Singapore. As in, I felt that it was quite interesting that you mentioned the art of Charlie Chan Hock Tai because like before that, I mean, it ran into some sort of controversy, right? When it was defunded for a while, for like because and like the portrayals of people like Lim Chin Siong or like the Barisan Socialist that was offered in the art of Charlie Chan Hock Tai, like it kind of like stepped on stepped on the toes of uh, certain like you know people and stuff, and also. Like so, there seems to be this kind of tension between, like you know, uh, like trying to like imagine history, but also you know, conflicting with like like, but like bring like uh into conflict into like certain like state interpretations. So like, how would you like sort of deal with that? Like the limits to historical discourse within Singapore. I I I have not personally encountered limits. Let's put it this way, as a historian, uh, I I've written on Singapore history in the sixties. Uh, I've lectured in, uh, and at NUS and at Yale NUS, um, spoken on themes of um, Singapore's evolution, and I don't think there's been limits placed on what I can say or I can't say. But of course, I have to be a responsible um, academic, right? And as I said, historical consciousness, historical imagination is not about just saying anything you want and then getting away with it. I think one has to be responsible in using evidence in a correct way and also explaining things in the right context. Now, I brought up Charlie Chan Hock Chai as an example of historical imagination that is really stretching right as far as it could go because, as I said, he was able to move, Sunny Liu was able to move seamlessly between fact and fiction. Now, he did not claim this to be a history book, and we should take it as that. It's a graphic novel telling the story of or his story of Singapore. Actually, there are two stories, right? One is the difficult life of a comic. A, 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 a writer uh, and the other one is about how the context of Singapore has changed and it was, he was exercising I think his artistic license but he was using history in that regard and if we can accept it for what it is then I don't think it's a cause of um, 
looking at him as a kind of uh, 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 alternate historian who's trying to uh, write a history uh, that is uh, not acceptable to Singapore. I think right now, in my view, is that we, have, we do have the space and we should be able to engage different interpretations of Singapore. And that's how, I guess, we can push the boundaries of history um, to uh, better appreciate, I think, the different nuances that I talked about and the different ways of understanding Singapore history. Uh, but of course, one assumes that this is done uh, with the uh, intention of educating, of trying to understand better, of reaching deeper appreciation of our complex history. Thank you. Thank you. And, and in that book too, uh, I think the bibliography yeah. had a, lot, a long bibliography referring to historical yeah. works. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes. The historical inference of Singapore's success is that it was successful because it was independent. How do you use that bit of history to suggest what its future should be? It was successful because it was independent and you are referring to independence from Malaysia. Well, you know, the, the, the earlier parts of my lectures, I've spoken about how Singapore has a past that pre well preceded Malaysia, well preceded 1940s and, and so on. And that if you look at that, then Singapore has always been a kind of a port city that has always been, during its more successful days, able to leverage on the environment around it. So it was able to plug into trade networks, it was able to trade with the Chinese, it was able to sort of operate within the sultanates in the region, and that accounted for its success, it's the dexterity. Now, in 1965, after we exited from Malaysia, Singapore became a nation state. Now, nation state places certain sort of constraints on how you are able to do things. You have to function within the community of nations. But that should not stop Singapore, which I've argued earlier, from functioning as a, as a global city-state, as a port city. And I think that independent Singapore will always have. When it went into Malaysia in 1963, I think the Tunku and Lee had uh, agreed that Singapore would be the New York of the Federation, while Washington, uh, sorry, uh, KL would be the Washington. Political control would reside in KL, but Singapore could do what it can continue doing what it does to make itself rich, and Singapore, uh, Malaysia will benefit from that. But then there were other political problems as a result. So that independence that you talked about is the independence to function in ways that work for Singapore, and I think Singapore has always treasured that and developed that and in its different forms, you know, as a colony, as a nation state, as part of a federation, it's always uh, exercised that independence. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, yes, uh, perhaps, Simon, let's defer to the gentleman in front first, and then you. Yeah, uh, yeah. go, no, no, oh, you. you yourself, yes, please go ahead, yeah. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed the lecture very much. I've been attending several of this lecture. Oh, sorry. My name is Rasim Asgarov. I'm professionally naval architect, but I'm enthusiast, enthusiastic about history. It's my hobby. My question is about the role of museums in the preservation of history. Recently, Singapore has built a number of museums, very beautiful and very good build it, which is designed it to deliver a message to the public auditorium about the importance of history. But the way that the message is delivered is, uh, uh, how to say, concerned. This concentration on the computer screens and <laughs> this information delivered by screening uh, I believe it's not enough. This is one very important function, which is all museums in the all around the world is famous for. It's a preservation of artifacts. And without artifacts, the museums become online or some electronic shows rather than museums. I would like you to comment this, please. Thank you. You know, museums are very difficult to run these days because the demography is so complex, right? So 
Yes, I, I agree with you fundamentally that you, know, you must be able to um, show and use artifacts to tell the story. And actually, uh, because I've been involved in some of the museums in Singapore, I know that no effort has been spared, no expenses have been spared to purchase those artifacts, if they're not found in Singapore, to make the exhibition rich and you know, compelling by the use of these artifacts. So the National Heritage Board, I know, spends millions of dollars uh, to buy and purchase these things and to make these things uh, uh, accessible to the public. But you know, young people, when they come to the museums, they sometimes don't want to see old pieces. They want to feel and touch and get what they call the interactive experience. So I think museums now have to find ways of catering to different audiences and how to make the, the shows compelling um, with that authenticity of the artifacts, but at the same time to engage young people who feel that they need to look at screens in order to understand things. So it's always a, com it's always a combination. But I must say that uh, the, the museums in Singapore, uh, you know, they have really invested a lot of time, effort, expenses, and intellectual capital thinking about how best to showcase some of these very compelling stories about Singapore. If you visit the Asian Civilization Museum, you visit the... Uh, National Museum of Singapore, or you, if you visit the community museums, the Indian Heritage Center, you see that you know, they tell very compelling stories. And it's always a combination of two, two sets of exhibits, the real stuff, the artifacts, as well as, I guess, um, the kinds of more uh, modern, uh, technologically advanced ways of telling the story. It's always a combination of both. Professor Simon Tay. Thank you, Kenwood. Uh, it's very good to see my old university friend. I'm very sorry to have missed the earlier lectures. I've uh, been traveling too much. I wanted to broaden it a bit, Taeyong. I mean, you're not just a Singaporean historian. You really have seen in you know, a much you know, broader lens. And there's this often the term, you know, on the wrong side of history. If I could ask you the venture, what are some of the global trends you think Singapore might be in danger of being on the wrong side of history? Um, for example, uh, the rise of China and our continued um, sort of, I mean, we are close to China, but there is also a strand of Singapore thinking like, like the status quo. Um, or in a social field, there are some Singaporeans who are very much in favor of uh, LGBTQ rights and others who are uh, quite against it. And the global trend has changed uh, economically as well. Our region is rising, but Singapore is quite different. Or something else, I mean, this idea of there's a global trend and Singapore, in a way, has often embraced our difference. So, big, broad, hairy question for you. Thank you, Simon. Simon was not supposed to ask me a question tonight. That's why I allowed him to come. But <laughs> it's obvious. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah. Simon's an old friend. And, a, and a, a very tough question to answer, you see, because one assumes that one knows how history is going to evolve, and therefore one can place yourself on the right side or wrong side of history. And people have told me that people who try to look at crystal balls will one day feel the taste of glass in your mouth because you'll always get it wrong. So it's hard to say whether we are on the right side or the wrong side of history. And that's why I mentioned context, and context is very important. You make a decision on what you decide is important or the, based on the limitations of what you have to work with in the context that's relevant to you now. So you may say that, okay, you know, the world trend seems to be great, greater liberalization and certain attitudes and all this, but not everybody agrees with you. And if you are placed to make a decision, you have to take that balance of how you decide to, to, to strike an agreement, um, a, a, a modus vivendi, that pleases as many people as possible. And that's not always easy. So I guess uh, the important thing in this regard is not so much history, is foresight. In other words, if I were to look ahead five and ten years, what is the scenario going to be like? What's the scenario going to be like? And then you take a call, and you may be wrong, and then you are said to be on the wrong side of history with the benefit of hindsight. Or you may be right, and then people will say, wow, you are really ahead of your time. You could read the thing very well. So as a historian, I will make that judgment 50 years down the road, if you would still hear me then, and I'll tell you whether Singapore now, in several of its policies, is on the right or the wrong side of history, because I can't tell. And it's always difficult judging with um, sort of um, without adequate information and without understanding the constraints that perhaps our decision makers have to work with 
um, to say whether we are wrong side. But we are responding, we are adapting, and I think Singapore is especially good at that because its small size allows it to move very, very quickly. Uh, I was once told by a minister that you know to change, say, the educational policy in a big country, it's a massive task because there are so many layers of governance, right? Federal, state, province, district, and all this. In Singapore, he could call all the principals to sit in a room like this and tell them that this is the policy, and then everybody hears from the horse's mouth. So size does help in Singapore's case, and I do think that there's a lot of forward planning and, and anticipation of what's going to happen. I was just making the call that as we look forward, don't forget to look backward because the past does offer us some interesting lessons that we can draw on. Simon, did your old friend answer your question? Okay, next please. Uh, yes, please, uh, go ahead. My name is Wee Chu Heng. I'm an architect. I am a bit concerned that here we are talking about uh, going in the wrong side of history. As far as conservation and demolition of Singapore is concerned, the policymakers know we are going to be on the wrong side of history, and yet they are not doing anything about it. I mean, that whole era of between 1940s, 1970s, things have been demolished, have gone, and the government is not doing anything about it. We are still continuing demolishing buildings by replacing them with worse things. So why, why can't this sense of history be told to the policy makers who are knowingly making things wrong? And why nothing is being done? And our younger generation cannot make this demand or request. They do not know of what has already existed. Because most of these buildings are gone. And even besides complaining about their old schools and their, and their neighborhood and their institution, today we knowingly going to demolish many of our buildings that were built in the era of the new government. So this new government will have nothing to say because everything will have gone. Thank, thank you, Mr. Wee, for your impassioned uh, intervention. Taiyong, please don't speak on behalf of the government. <laughs> Give us your truthful opinion. You know, uh, uh, if I were not involved in NHB in any way, and speaking as a total outsider, I, I may have similar views and say that, yeah, they should do more, you know, and they should try this and do that and not do this. But being involved in some ways, I, I, I cannot be totally objective because I can say that there are efforts, there are efforts to try to understand Singapore's heritage, to preserve the heritage, and there are all sorts of moves now being taken to study the sort of uh, the viability of keeping this and that. But you know, it's always a trade-off happening somewhere. And decision makers are put there for a reason. They have to take these decisions. So in fairness, in fairness to the government, I would say that they are trying their best, but sometimes it's just not possible. And when you take a policy, some people are going to be unhappy. And I, 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 I think it's one of those things you have to accept. So. I don't think it is the case that nothing is being done is total oblivious, uh, oblivion or no lack of care. I don't think that's the case. But still, can more be done? I think this is all about trade-offs and how you make these decisions in, the, uh, in, a, in, in a situation that you're in. And when you have to take uh, decisions where some people will be affected, then I think there's going to be um, reactions. So I think this is just one of those ongoing things. Okay, I thought I asked you not to speak on behalf of government. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Wee, we can continue that conversation in, again. Uh, please, uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Teng Siung Ho. I'm both a history graduate as well as a docent in many museums. Just got two points to make. Number one, on museums, uh, you, uh, Prof Tan flashed the picture of the knee-jerk reaction to the renaming of the Shonan Gallery, I guide there. And quite often visitors thought that it is nothing but a museum of automobiles. That is rather uh, you know, <laughs> uh, unfortunate. Uh, maybe retaining the old name, Memories Old Four Factory, could have been better than calling it the former Four Factory. I don't know what are the better names there would be. And the second point, as a history graduate, I have peers who have been uh, labelled as revisionist historian. Although you said you welcome uh, revising history, and yet many of our archival materials are still not open. Our archives are not open to say, for example, for us to judge 
was the Marxist conspiracy right or wrong? Uh, should there have been people who should have been exonerated uh, rather than still being labelled you know, as uh, subversive? Thank you. So I will, I will now not speak for the government, <laughs> but speak as a historian. I've been speaking as a historian, actually. Now, the point is this. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the word revisionist history has been used um, to describe people who write a certain form of history that does not quite uh, tally with an official narration. Um, I have had difficulties accepting that term um, in, in, that, in that regard because I think all historians or all academics revise scholarship because that's, a, that's what we do. I mean, we try with new evidence, new interpretations. We try to shift the boundaries of knowledge. And in the process of shifting the boundaries of knowledge, we are, revi uh, we are, we are revising you know, the narrative. And so this is revisionist, revis revisionism in scholarship, which we all do. So I, I have no problems with that term. Um, I fully agree that uh, perhaps uh, for people to do proper history, then materials evidence have to be available. And this is where I fully agree with you. I, I don't know what the issues are, but perhaps the archives should declassify more consistently, more regularly, so that materials can be open, and then let historians go in and have a look, and then make an interpretation of a particular event using evidence, using evidence. Um, maybe this will happen gradually, uh, and I suspect that, again, um, the National Archives and National Library Board will be, I guess, um, trying to see whether there are materials that they can open as Singapore progresses. So uh, I believe we have an Archives Act that, se that says that 25 years or 30 years after, uh, and this is a former chairman of the National Archives Board, uh, after uh, 25 years after the record was, was uh, created, that it has to be made open to the public. But I can tell you that there's a whole host of reasons why this doesn't happen. And partly because organizations, as they grow, as they evolve, as they move, some records are lost, some records are not properly kept. I think Singapore doesn't have an archiving culture. Uh, I've always maintained that maybe this will change from now on, but in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, maybe you know, things were just put in the file and put away. So maybe time will change and we will have access to better records and on the basis of those better records, have a better understanding of our complex history. Maybe that's the way we'll, we should be moving forward. Taeyong, if I could push that a little more, because we, we spoke about painful and traumatic memories. And in our last session, you, in discussion with Professor Wang Gangwu, he mentioned about history uh, being written from the viewpoint of the victors. And of course, they are not only the losers, but some who might see themselves as victims. Right? And, uh, and, and at, at any one time, uh, the very subject of history or particular episodes may seem to be almost taboo and unspeakable. And then things may change as, as time goes along and so on. But in the meanwhile, there could be some persons who, who feel that there's this sense of woundedness uh, and they, they were struggling to find some voice to, to place on record their version. Yeah. What, what, what would you say to that? I, I say all power to them. They should write their version. They should, I, I don't think anybody should be stopped telling their own stories. And I think we should listen to this range of stories as well because that's the way you're going to enrich your understanding. Listening to just one version, one interpretation, one narrative will just narrow your worldview. So I would say that, you know, I think I've... I have in my library many, many books uh, written by uh, people who were defeated in the 1960s. Uh, but at the same time, I find that the story is compelling. I don't always agree with the interpretation of the events, but just looking or reading their personal accounts enriches my understanding of what happened. That, to me, is historical consciousness, to feel about that time and that place and how the people acted. The unobservable part, as I said, trying to get into the minds and understanding what motivated those people. And, and I think it's time we move beyond this whole um, dichotomy between them and us, heroes and villains, that I think, you know, if we understand that period as a group of people all trying to envision a future for Singapore, they may have different views, different visions, but they were all nationalists in a way, trying to find 
the answer moving forward as Singapore emerged out of colonial rule. And I think we should accept that interpretation. And then when you see that, then you, you don't create a dichotomy between the, the victors and the vanquished, the heroes and the villains, the winners and the losers, but you see them as a group of emerging Singaporeans trying to articulate a vision for Singapore. They may have different methods, the, the methods may have clashed, but in the end, that's what they wanted for the country that they were in. And I think that would be the way forward in my view. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, we have reached the, the end of our hour. i just like to say that what we have witnessed, not just tonight, but in this entire series, is the mind of a historian thinking aloud and sharing with us what it means to have that kind of historical consciousness and the historical imagination. And it turns out that you are a pretty good storyteller too, <laughs> eh? uh, based on evidence. Eh? <laughs> Uh, I'd just like to close with a, a, a small point here which might be fleshed up maybe down the road, which is that uh, I, I sense from you also that the idea of the study of history and re historical reflection is perhaps also linked to not just critical judgment but perhaps even moral reasoning about what could have been, what should have been and maybe what would have been. And they did not pan out for many, many reasons which we can now try to understand, but they also extend and widen and deepen our imagination. I would just answer one word, empathy. I think we just need to create empathy about what happened in the past so that we can use that past to enrich ourselves. But if you are using that past to judge, then I think you will always have to take sides, right? And make decisions. But if it's empathize and embrace, then I think you will be able to have a more inclusive sense of the past that has shaped all of us in different ways. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tanta Yong.